The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Brooke, Christian, Kent, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, Jackie, Annabelle, Dawn, and Megan. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In today's episode, we are going to be talking about two women from the 19th century, Matilda Anek and Mary Booth, who had a known companionship great in this time period and we're going to be looking at what that relationship was like and okay. how we modern folk can examine that as a possible queer relationship great let's get into it hello and welcome to remedial her story the other 50 percent the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class now here's your host Kelsey Brooke Eckert and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we are going to be asking the question, how should we define female friendships in the 19th century? And we're joined in this episode by Dr. Allison Efford. Um, I'm so excited to have her on the podcast because um, in the 19th century, there were a lot of women who lived together as friends. Yeah. And companions. And sometimes that was out of economic necessity because they mm -hmm. were single women. And we have lots of examples of these women really, really loving each other. Yeah. And so this episode is sort of an introduction to queer studies. Okay. While using these two women and their friendship as an example to help us understand how to help students think about queer figures from the past and how we should define them. And yeah. if we if we should define them at right. all. And how do you ascertain those relationships and how do they equate to their life and what they contributed to? So yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. So let's have Dr. Allison Efford introduce herself. I am Alison Clark Efford. I am an associate professor of history at Marquette University in um in Milwaukee, um, although I am originally from New Zealand. And I usually identify myself professionally as a historian of immigration to the US. Uh, I started um, with an interest in, I think, especially researching European immigration to the US and thinking about how especially white people, white newcomers have been part of the fabric of the United States and how um, race and gender and class has worked for um, white newcomers like myself. And then I've gotten into um, gender history and women's history more recently, um, following um, Matilda Francisca Annika, an individual who really um, caught my attention. Well, I'm so excited to learn about her, and I'm just fascinated by a New Zealander who immigrated to the United States who wanted to research Europeans immigrating <laughs> to the United States. That's amazing. So how did you um, stumble upon Matilda, your, the focus of your research and your recent book? Yes, I should say that I've started calling her Matilda. I mean, I've read so many of her yeah. letters. I feel like we are on a first name basis, <laughs> um, Matilda. Um, Matilda Francisca Annika. Well, my first book was on um, German immigrants and um, race politics during the Civil War era, and she just showed up. Um, this woman um, who was an abolitionist and a feminist became a woman suffragist she had fought in the German revolutions of 1848, actually fought, 
And then she moved to Milwaukee, where I now live. Um, and she she just seemed like an extraordinary individual. Everybody seemed to like her, despite the fact that she held quite radical opinions and a lot of the people who liked her didn't share her, her politics. She also happened to write a whole lot of letters. So, you know, historians, we love these primary sources. There's a huge cache of Annika letters, um, mostly um, mostly between her and her estranged husband, Fritz, uh, mostly in this old German script um, that's very challenging even for um, native German speakers today to read. And she loved putting her feelings down on paper. Um, and it just seemed like a really fascinating opportunity to get into the sort of personal dimensions of her life. It sounds really, sp I mean, I love uh, nerding out about the access to the letters. That's really special. <laughs> what an amazing thing. So she comes up in your first work looking at German immigrants, and then you decide to focus in on her and go in on gender and sexuality and all of the layers of her activism. So tell me a little bit about her. I mean, other than, so she's a, a, a badass who fought in a war <laughs> and then immigrant and then immigrates. Um, what else about, tell me about this person. Why is she significant um, in our history uh, for the U S so if we go back, I think it is useful to sort of think of her, her upbringing and then what, what life is like for her when she becomes active in, in politics in the US in the 1850s. She was born in 1817 in Prussian Westphalia, so a part of Europe that is now part of Germany, right? It was, it was a Prussian-controlled um, territory. Um, and she grew up relatively sort of comfortably off. She got a good education, but then her family fell on hard times. They essentially married her off. The, the guy that she married gave the family money to pay off debts. So she got married off at age 19. The guy was a jerk. He drank too much and he was abusive. So she spent, she had to extract herself from this marriage and she had a baby. And that process of kind of extracting herself from a violent, abusive uh, marriage turned her into a lifelong feminist. Right? And she started writing about how law and tradition she used the word enslaved, enslaved women, right, by making it so they couldn't control their lives and these, these and potentially a violent man would have control over them. And then she got more involved after she secures this divorce, she got more involved in radical politics and she, she um, remarried and published a newspaper um, in the revolutions of 1848 and then she ends up going and fighting um, as a, they called it an ordinance of Um, So it was kind of like a messenger, a support officer um, in the revolutions of 1848 when these Europeans, these European dissidents are trying to create a democratic um, government, but they fail. <laughs> and then a lot of them end up in the US. So she ended up as a refugee, um, a political refugee in the United States. Um, and she had a really hard time after she arrived in the United States. She um, she lost four children. Four of her four of her children died, oh and, and it just in it devastated infancy or like in childhood. In childhood, so so oh. at different ages. Um, yeah, two died very young. There were two twins that died very young, but then the others um, were a bit older, and I think those losses were even harder for her. But she and she, they would show up in her letters every year. She would remember and miss the children um, who, who had died. Um, that really affected her. Um, she also she had setbacks too. She she published this is a first. She published the first woman woman owned feminist newspaper in the United States. It was in German. <laughs> Not very many copies have survived, but, but she had that first, but then it, it, it didn't work out. Um, and she grew apart from her second husband too. So she was having all these struggles in the 1850s. And I sort of feel like saying, don't worry, she'll be okay. And she ends up later on, later in her life, she ends up 
um, being a founding vice president of the National Women's Suffrage Association. She works with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony, and she sort of becomes this prominent woman suffragist in, in the state of um, Wisconsin, um, and she opens a girls' school um, that becomes quite famous, well, well-regarded locally. Um, but if you in the 1850s, right, the end of the 1850s, just before the Civil War is starting in the US, she's just at this real low because she's had these setbacks and she's lost these children. And then, and this sort of becomes the centre of the book that I've, I've written with uh, my colleague Victoria Village, um, then she meets Mary Booth. And the book is a lot about this relationship. I became really interested in how we understand intense relationships between women in the mid-1800s. And that relationship between Matilda Arnica and Mary Booth um, is really sort of at the heart of, of my research at the moment and, and the, um, the, the letters in this book um, that we have translated and edited. When you say intense, what do you mean by intense relationships between these two women? I feel like I should quote some letters. Yeah. Are you in- <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, well, they they would hug, they would kiss, they would share a bed. They ended up moving in together and um, moving to Switzerland for a time together and raising their children, the the surviving children, um, uh, three children total, two of Matilda's and one of uh, Mary Bruce, raising them together and the children called both women mama. So that they they created a household together. They created a family. Um, and some historians have described this as a marriage. Hmm. And they wrote very strongly worded letters to each other about how much they loved each other. This is one little note um, from Mary Booth to Matilda, um, and it was in 1862. So Mary said to Matilda, pardon me, my dear, for writing you such a miserable little note saying I was unhappy. I am indeed very happy when I think of your sweet love. It glorifies every even and illuminates the darkest midnights. You are the morning star of my soul. I love that. The morning star of my soul, the beautiful auroral glow of my heart, the saintly lily of my dream, the deep dark rosebud unfolding in my bosom day by day, sweetening my life with your ethereal fragrance. Dearest, you are the reality of my dreams, my life, my love. I have no more sorrow. I have you, my dear and dearest friend. Good night, your Mary. So that's what I mean when I say intense. (laughs) I need to raise my standards for love. I know. Everyone deserves a 19th century love letter, I think. (laughs) Oh, it's beautiful. The Remedial Herstory Project is hosting its second annual Summer Educators Retreat to help teachers integrate more women's history and literature into their curriculum. Studies show that educators currently teach women's history between 5 and 20% of the time, with 5% being the plurality. Our retreat will feature speakers from around the world and be available online and in person and provide educators with dozens of packaged lesson plans, videos, and other tools and resources to get women into every unit of their curriculum. The best part is that in-person attendees will get to network and relax with peers who are passionate about working to incorporate the diverse history of half the population all but left out of the history classroom. The retreat will take place at New Hampshire's Common Man Inn and Spa at the heart of the White Mountains of New Hampshire, the best place to be in August. The retreat will take place between August 8th and 10th. Interested people can learn more on our website at www.remedialherstory.com slash summer dash educators dash retreat. Uh, you know, this would at least be a civil marriage in modern times. How does how do you as a historian grapple with sort of different times and different expectations of people, different ideas of relationships? When when you look at this, what do you, how, you know, how would they have seen it in their time? 
this is very tricky. To me, this is the question of the book. Um, and I found that it's a question that fascinates students too, uh, because we don't have easy answers. It's something that we can kind of turn over to students and say, how would you characterize this relationship? I guess I have spoken to sort of the intensity and the fact that it was cohabiting. So in a practical sense, it's a family. At the same time, Matilda had a husband who was still alive, who she wrote letters to all the time. Um, and she really saw herself as co-parenting with her, her sort of estranged husband. Um, she said to him, we no longer love each other as lovers, but we love each other because of the children we have together. Um, so, so the nature of that marriage, her marriage with a man, had changed, but it was she never suggested that her relationship with Mary was in competition with her relationship with her husband. Um, Mary was also estranged from her husband, um, who was kind of a jerk. Um, and I think there she had really left her, very Booth had left her husband um, behind in a more, it would have been more of a break there. Um, and I haven't found people disapproving of this relationship, which I think we might think, right, that it's um, sort of that it would be considered inappropriate for two women to think about each other in, in these ways, that, that there would be some stigma associated with what on some level seems like a lesbian relationship. The interesting thing is that this sort of relationship, which was very intense and was cohabiting, sort of existed along with a number of sort of socially accepted, very intense relationships among women. Like women had strong friendships with other women um, and they spoke of women effusively and it wasn't unusual for friends to hug and kiss and maybe you know, if there weren't that many beds, ending up sleeping in the, the same bed. I think that Matilda and Mary didn't have to decide whether they were straight or lesbian. Um, when we look at the sort of gay history, it's really not till the late 1800s that the idea of same-sex attraction is sort of crystallised um, in in the minds of um, so-called experts as its sort of own social category. So I'm not saying, I mean, obviously there were people who loved um, people of the same gender before the late 1800s. There were people who slept with people of the same gender before, before the end of the um, 1800s. But it's at the end of the 1800s that being homosexual um, the, the, the terminology of, of the time becomes a sort of category, right? That, that a relationship or a person could be categorized um, through the lens of same sex attraction. So I would say that, uh, and I'm quite happy to argue, and I love that, that lesbians um, claim Matilda, um, some lesbians claim Matilda and Mary, but I would say they're sort of pre-lesbian and also pre-straight, right? It doesn't mean that they were really straight. It means that they, they, they existed in this time when relationships were different to what we think of now. Maybe even more freeing. They could be just be and not have to have those labels and titles. That's fascinating. I read somewhere that... Um, there were also issues with, and so just to bring in argument, I guess, that there were issues with um, ratios between men and women and that there were just more women around in the U.S. at this time. And maybe that's not quite accurate, but they were talking about um, Boston marriages. It was like the nickname or Boston friendships and um, how women just lived together sometimes out of practicality. Um, and so I guess a question I have about this is clearly these women love each other. The let, I mean, that letter is like unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> what, when, you know, I guess 
love and sex and those are like different things and is there evidence that there was a sexual relationship or component to this other than sharing a bed which could be an innocent necessity it's interesting how all these themes sort of overlap in our minds isn't it I could not say that there's sort of evidence of genital contact right if that's how we're sort of defining kind of sexuality I'm quite happy saying it was romantic, right? Like it was, it could be a little sort of erotic. There was sometimes a bit of jealousy um, involved. Uh, so yeah, it sort of depends where you want to draw the line and what becomes meaning for you, meaningful for you in categorizing um, relationships. I really loved what you said about how it could potentially be freeing um, to see relationships in this other way. I think we have to be a bit careful that we don't um, sort of deny lesbians a history, right? If we have a very high bar for lesbianism, like we need evidence of this happening, then, then it's sort of like lesbians don't get any history because that's a really high bar in the, in the historical evidence. <laughs> but I would say that I kind of, I like, instead of trying to squeeze this relationship into our categories, it is cool to think about how relationships can be different right relation how we think about relationships has a history right that that those very intimate like very the things have changed over time to the to the extent that people can just really think about their relationships differently I love that I, I that's a really great way of thinking about especially this idea of making sure people have a history because if you yeah if you set the bar too high then it's like you know, oh, that's so powerful. Do these women live together till the end of their lives? How, um, what happens in their story? It has a sad ending. No, I'm so over the sad <laughs> ending in this theme. <laughs> um, I, I think the book should be a movie because it does have this sort of arc of like, will their, will their relationship survive? How will yeah. things work out? And these they have all these sort of obstacles thrown in their way. Um, Mary is sick. Um, I think she has tuberculosis. She has a, maybe a few different things, but she was coughing up blood. So now we can treat um, tuberculosis with antibiotics, but that wasn't an option for her and that tuberculosis could be, be fatal. So they were living in Switzerland. They were enjoying, in many ways, living in Switzerland. They were taking sort of little trips with their, with their kids. It sort of seemed, I mean, like they were, they were celebrating birthdays and Christmas and sort of do, with these little outings. But they were struggling to make money. They were both writing, but often they wouldn't get paid, which is probably because they were women. They were writing abolitionist fiction um, and also anti-slavery um, sort of opinion pieces for German language newspapers. But Mary was getting sicker and she wanted to come back to the United States to try some experimental medical treatments. And also she had left her older daughter in Connecticut with her mother. And she, I, if she was going to die, she wanted to see her older daughter again. So Matilda very reluctantly um, sort of says goodbye um, to, to Mary. Um, and she writes about this in her letters to Fritz, her estranged husband, saying, oh, this is probably the last time I'm going to see Mary. This is so hard. Um, uh, and then, yeah, Mary dies um, within a year of, of leaving to go back to the U.S. And why did she choose to stay in Switzerland? U.S. was not for her. She did come back a, a little later, but it was partly about the education that she wanted for her children. She wanted her children to be able to speak German um, at, at a high level, which actually you could speak plenty of German in Milwaukee at that time. Um, but, but she really liked the idea of a European education. And also she really didn't have much money um, and she was in debt. So it was, she felt like it wasn't the right moment when she could move um, to the United States. So Matilda ended up moving back to Milwaukee at the end of 1865. 1865 is the year um, the U.S., Civil War ends too. So their story um, intertwines with the story of, of the US Civil War. Mm. 
probably a bit why it's overshadowed. <laughs> uh, but it's also, I mean, one of the special things about the relationship is that it allows them to be activists. It sort of allows them to support each other kind of practically and emotionally while they are trying to push uh, push anti-slavery. So because at first Abraham Lincoln was kind of slow so that the abolitionists, even during the Civil War, um, and especially African-Americans, um, were, were pushing towards abolition. Mm. It strikes me that these women are activists, they are suffragists, abolitionists, writers, intellectuals. Um, and, you know, Susan B. Anthony comes to mind as another woman who has these loving friendships with other women. Carrie Catt, who becomes president of NASA after her, was, you know, buried alongside her longtime roommate and lover. Am I just noticing anecdotes or do you think there's a pattern here that like these activist women also maybe live outside a lot of the conventions of marriage and other things or am I am I adding too many layers <laughs> no I think you're right I there's a new book that's going to come out by um Wendy Rouse about um queer women who are involved in the women's suffrage movement and I think for a while um, a lot of feminists wanted to say, I'm a feminist. That doesn't mean I'm a lesbian, right? So there was an effort at, at, at a point in women's history to say, just because you're a feminist doesn't mean you're a lesbian. And so there was overlooking some of the, the role of um, same, same-sex relationships um, in, in these histories. I, now I sort of feel like I would like to go out and do a sort of quantitative study to sort of what percentage of, of, of women who were very active um, were, were involved in these relationships. And I would say that there's also, there's a spectrum, right? Like some of them are sort of really powerful kind of collaborative friendships, right? Um, which is which is an important thing to recognize too, right? That that women's relationships of all kinds can be really powerful. Um, and then some of them, I think, you know, if they had had the opportunity to marry, they would have. That 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 would best fit <laughs> um, how they they thought about that relationship and the role in, in the, its role in their life. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing this history with me. I want to get my hands on these letters because I feel like reading them would be so powerful and um, asking students to categorize, you know, where, like, how would you, how would you, how would you, would you, should we, <laughs> you know, these, these questions that you are asking, I think are really great um, ones. And, and how, how would you describe 19th century versus 20th century and 21st century relationships. Um, I think these are really important questions for students to be thinking about because I think they're also thinking about it right now. There's so many students that are it's a huge shift, generational shift with students questioning their sexuality, identifying as, you know, they, them, or, you know, pronouns that don't reflect um, the way that they were labeled as at birth. And I think they're just, there's so much going on with our students that these types of conversations in a history class and helping them understand that it hasn't always been like this and that it doesn't have to be like this um, is really, really important for young people to, to, hold and, and have a little bit more tangible understanding of, of our past um, in a way that maybe hasn't been shared in, in the classroom before. Yeah, and I can imagine, um, I teach in a university context, I can imagine that maybe some high school teachers would feel uncomfortable going there. But I think if you have students looking at the primary sources, at these documents and looking at the letters and trying to make, yeah, as you sort of characterize them and, and use that as a way to think about their own, the students' own sort of social worlds. I, I think that there's a way where it's not um, the, the teacher projecting their views. Um, it's, it's an exploration of human life. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, and I think it shouldn't be. I think it should be a question. You know, what do you guys look at these sources? What do you think? Center, center the letters and, and let the students decide. So powerful. Well, uh, Professor Efford, thank you so much for your time and your energy here. I am so grateful. You have a book out, and um, it was published from the University of Georgia Press, and folks can find your book there and on Amazon. Is that right? Yep, that's right. It's called Radical Relationships, the Civil War Era Correspondence of Matilda Francisca Anika. And I should definitely do a shout out to my collaborator, Victoria Billich, was a professor of translation and it was it was a real joy to work on this with her. In your book, can teachers and others find these letters translated there? It mostly consists of the letters. Wow. Um, so it's mostly a sort of primary source reader. That's amazing. So it sounds like we need to go buy that immediately in order to teach this history thoroughly. (laughs) (laughs) Or have your library buy it. (laughs) Yeah, or that. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It's been lovely. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.